On the Shoe Render Drawing channel today, I'm going to show you how to draw a pepper mill. But this is really a lesson in stipple shading. What's that all about? Mm, let's not talk about it. Let's do it. This is going to be as much a tutorial on how to draw a pepper pot as it is a kind of a 3D lesson. This is going to be the, the little knob on the top. So I'm following down this center line and then this is kind of the bit on the top that you hold to turn around and people often ask me could I show the reference material for this well I haven't got any I'm drawing this straight out of my head okay <laughs> um, so it might be a little truncated but anyway so you can imagine this inside there you've got a an ellipse and here we have a little kind of two bits of turning so the whole thing is kind of built by turning it round and round and round and and, and getting a chisel and carving it out while it's spinning and then here we're going to want to curve like that and then again you see inside you're going to get this ellipse so that's what we're aiming for and we're going to have another little bit of turning like that and then it will come out a little bit wider there I'm hoping this is going to fit into the bottom of the page because otherwise I'm going to have to slightly readjust the camera there I'll bring that down a little bit more and that will be the bottom of the pepper mill this should really be a little wider here. So I'm just going to go around these shapes. Get this nice curve coming in there. And the same here, get a nice curve coming around into there. This is an extra bit of kind of turning in the wood. And then we want to get the kind of neck shoulder of the this will have the grinding mechanism in the bottom there. So we're gonna have the light coming from this direction, which means the shade will be kind of mostly around there and kind of up there, down there, there'll be a bit of light kind of reflecting on the top surface of that and then coming down there as well and then we're going to have a bit of shadow on the bottom there like that but first I think we're going to want to have a kind of a wood effect and here two kind of come around and these little bits of wood grain effect you can really use to where that comes down there then that will kind of curve over there and then down so you can really use these to help um, with the shape sort of give the three-dimensional molding kind of feel to it by giving these little that will probably come around there that certainly will so that's going to be almost a circly bit down there and I'm drawing these with slightly feathery lightness and that bit all moves on the top, so that's a separate piece to this piece. And then here, I'm just going to go there and stop and then carry on down because we want to have a little kind of line of light reflection on this, on, on the shadow shoulder of the piece here. And this is usually quite a knurled bit for you to hold on to to this the kind of little screw on the top and now I'm going to start building up with stippling and this is just a long slow process and you need to kind of take your time and that's kind of the main area it's going to be because the light will be shining on the top there but we'll get some shadow here there'll be quite dark shadow underneath there but then that will get lighter as it goes out so make sure it's quite dark up next to the 
little knurled nut on the top. I'm going to put the table in. I would say put it on the table. Um, we're going to have light reflecting up from the table, so underneath here will be quite light. So you don't want to have it too dark. The darkest part is going to be kind of a band around here. But you need to make sure that you don't get too many blobs starting to join up together because then you start getting patterns in your stippling. And then here, that would be the darkest part along there, underneath, and probably a little bit underneath there as well. And again, people say, you know, where, what have you got for reference? And I'm making this up out of my head um, from, you know, the shading. Um, there are some bits are probably completely wrong. But, um, you know, if I had a pepper pot in front of me, I would maybe do the shading slightly differently because I would have reference. <laughs> but I'm making this up out of my head. Uh, but that's kind of years of experience of drawing things and knowing where light comes from and how things reflect. You've got this, always remember this ambient light reflecting up from the table. So you'd think everything, if the light's coming from there, you think everything on this side would be dark. But it's not necessarily so. The stippling style was really, really popular kind of in the 1970s. And all the do-it-yourself books. Um, and you know, how to how to strip wallpaper and things like that were all done in this style. Reader's Digest was famous for using um, artists with this style. And I think the reason was because colour printing then was extremely expensive, and it still is. It gives you a good sort of high contrast black and white tonal effect. Now we're going to want this mostly around here. And now here I'm going to just put some in, in quite random, but m much further. You want the spacing to be close together in the middle and let the spacing between the dots sort of get further and further apart as you go around the body of the pot. I also feel it's going to be darker around the top here than it is at the bottom of this kind of main shaft of the pot. This is quite laborious, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I suppose I'm partly um, kind of squinting while I'm doing this to so that I'm not really looking at the dots, I'm looking at the tonal value that's building up while I'm drawing it. I'm not really sort of sharp focusing on the drawing. Almost looking through it so that, you know, I'm just kind of seeing how the tone is building up. And if anybody wants to be really nerdy, then you can kind of slow this video right down and count every single dot. <laughs> I have no idea how many there would be. I think also in the 1970s, you know, photographing, printing photographs wasn't um, that easy in black and white as well. You didn't get really good, you know, it cost a lot to get really good reproduction. And so you could do this working from photographs but at the same time you can adapt and take out the bits that you really really need that are really important for the illustration it was not a photographic effect but you can have that kind of tonal effect of a photograph but just showing the important parts without you know having to spend a fortune on getting a really really good photograph that would reproduce well back in the back in the 70s and 80s. I know I used to do printing back then and the effort we had to go through to print black and white photographs. We had a huge great repro camera in a little dark room and we used to um, have a thing called a screen so you get your photograph and then you put this... Oops the battery just ran out. I was just <laughs> I was saying, we had these huge great repro cameras and you'd have this semi-transparent screen called a, called a screen. <laughs> And, um, and it kind of had uh, semi-transparent lines ruled across it. And you'd have to practice and practice and do samples and things. The light coming through the grid will kind of split the photograph up into dots. And it was really, really hard to, to get them looking really good. Whereas now you scan them and it, all the computers does all that 
kind of hard work. Now I'm going to start on the shadow here. That's going to be the extent. Now I'm just going to erase all these pencil lines. And again, this is going to be a lot darker around the base. When desktop publishing came in, and early scanners, you know, were practical to have at home. I had a funny little Logitech thing. This was kind of one of the effects it would do to print, and it was kind of quite cool at the time. <laughs> a little bit more around the bottom to give it a bit of a curve inwards. Actually, easiest for me to see how it's doing by looking in the um, camera. I think I put a little bit too much around here, unfortunately. That's because I'm not using reference, really. <laughs> if I'd had. A reference photograph I'd have been more careful, but it gives you the idea. If you like this stippling style and would like to know more about it, you know, let me know in the comments box below. Let me know what you would like to uh, see me draw in this sort of style. It's not, it's not something I do every day, so I'm not claiming to be an expert. I'm just kind of showing you how it's done. As with all these things, you know, the more you do it, the better you get at it. When I was at art college, we had a, a lecturer come to teach us once a week called Richard Jacobs, and he did an awful lot of this kind of thing for um, Reader's Digest and whatever. And when I left college, I helped him for a bit. <laughs> he got snowed down, had too much work, and I went and uh, I kind of drew drew the pictures in the ink and in pencil, and he then went and inked them in because it had to be done in his style. And he was a genius at drawing hands. <laughs> Because that's what it was mostly all about, sort of hands holding hammers, showing you how to hammer things in and how to strip wallpaper with a wallpaper knife. But that whole kind of business was just gone because it's easy to photograph and, and you know, and on the internet with screens and everything, you don't need this style anymore. But you might want to do it for its own sake or just to have a bit of fun. There we go, I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs>